thank you again. It's a great opportunity to speak at your Congress. And uh, what I'm going to speak about uh, for uh, diagnostic and therapeutic applications of cryotechnologies in the airways. We all know how things work uh, and that we use Joule Thompson effect of cooling the gas uh, at the tip of the probe. And uh, the effect on tissue actually depends on uh, time of application, uh, pressure at the tip of the probe and uh, the type of tissue we treat. Of course, the F effect of cryotherapy is better on mucosa and tissue that contains water than on cartilage and bone, and we use that in all uh, things uh, we do during uh, uh, applying cryotechnologies. Equipment is really very simple. You need console, you need a gas, gas tank with either CO2 or, azot or, or uh, 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 nitrogen monoxide, uh, conductor, uh, cryoprobe, uh, of different sizes and diameters. Uh, now, the most, uh, the, the newest one is 1.1 cryoprobe, but uh, it, it can be from 1.1 to 2.4 millimeter. These are flexible cryoprobes, and there is also one rigid cryoprobe, and a flow regulator. Actually, you can change two things uh, here. You can change the, the flow of gas and the time of application. Really, very simple. And trial, trial uh, technologies that we use inside the airways, first cryobiopsy either uh, for uh, uh, directly vis visible lesions in the airway or peripheral cryobiopsies. Cryo, we can use it, uh, especially it's very uh, useful in ICUs when you are removing blood clots, for example, after tracheostomy or something like that, when there is a blood clot uh, causing atelectasis, you can remove blood clot by freezing it and removing it in one piece. Uh, you can remove foreign bodies that contain water, also very good indication for cryo extraction. And you can remove sometimes a uh, uh, whole tumor, uh, but there are some limitations to that procedure, you'll see. And uh, uh, we can apply cryotherapy for treatment either of malignant or benign stenosis that does not require immediate uh, uh, disobstruction and cryospray uh, in treatment uh, of uh, emphysema. Why is cryobiopsy an emerging uh, technique? First, uh, when we are uh, doing endobronchial conventional endobronchial biopsies with forceps, the positivity is really very high. In most of the cases, we really don't need any other procedures. But it depends on lesion appearance, of contact with blood vessels, of experience of the operator, of choice of biopsy site, and of course, the number of specimens taken. We usually take three to four uh, uh, specimens uh, from, the, uh, from the lesion, and after, you know, fifth or sixth, uh, it doesn't matter. The, the probability of uh, bleeding, uh, uh, significant bleeding rises, but you don't increase the positivity on finding. Some, but specimens sometimes can be of insufficient diagnostic value due to crash artifacts and small sample size, and it's a more an obstacle in other lung diseases when we need more tissue than in lung malignancies uh, where actually uh, we are satisfied with only like 10 or 15 cells. And if biopsy is negative, we need to do the more invasive procedure. We need to repeat the bronchoscopy. And cryobiopsy is maybe the answer for the direct lesions, directly visible lesions. It's subjecting tissue to cryofixation by a liquid cryogen to preserve tissue for subsequent morphologic and immunohistochemical analysis. And that second part of the definition is key. So what, uh, what are the advantages? First, you get the tissue without crash effect. Size and quality and the volume of samples is excellent. Cryoprobe is freezing 360 degrees around. So you get the good uh, size and quality of the sample. Uh, the tissue is susceptible for genetic test testing, and since the, since the target tissue can be frozen uh, to the cryoprobe both directly and, tan and, you and tangentially to the cryoprobe, uh, really you don't need to maneuver too much with the cryoprobe to get the proper biopsy as you ca have to do with, with forceps. Uh, biopsy is also possible in hard-to-reach target areas. <coughs> 
What are the features of uh, cryobiopsy? First, the depth of tissue penetration is, is around three millimeters and uh, depends on the freeze time, cryosensitivity of the tissue already mentioned. And this feature together with the resistance of cartilage to cryotherapy lowers the risk of airway perforation when compared to other bronchoscopic techniques, especially when we use those techniques in biopsying submucosal lesions, submucosal infiltrations inside the airways. And large amounts of endobronchial tumor uh, can be removed. Uh, sometimes cryobiopsy can be a cryo uh, recanalization at the same time. So interventional diagnostic and therapeutic procedure. How does it look like? Well, I did this with uh, rigid cryoprobe. It, uh, it was proven to be uh, tracheal papilloma. Freeze the tissue and remove it in one piece and it's enough to repeat that biopsy once more and really not not more and you can see that uh, bleeding occurred but this bleeding is not really very significant at the same time we are treating the lesion with cryoprobe not just taking biopsy and the size of the sample as you can see is pretty good Studies uh, on endobronchial cryobiopsy started uh, in uh, 2008 uh, and this, it, it was the first study uh, which described uh, that the tissue is good for molecular analysis and the artifact-free sample area of these cryobiopsies were, uh, was uh, very good and tissue samples were of high quality and of high volume. In those patients, uh, both cryorecanalization and cryopsy uh, were done. And it encouraged other authors to do more with cryobiopsy. And this study was uh, published 2010 with around 300 patients with visible endobronchial tumors, which practically repeated the success of the previous study. The results showed a significantly higher diagnostic yield for cryobiopsy compared with forceps and sample size much bigger. And the overall diagnostic yield of cryobiopsy was uh, around 90%. Uh, in 5% of cryobiopsy cases, uh, a complication as bleeding occurred. But I really don't consider bleeding as a complication of bronchoscopy. It's a consequence of biopsy, not a complication. Cryobiopsy increases the diagnostic yield of endobronchial biopsy, which was proven on 600 patients in that study, where cryobiopsy was directly compared to forceps biopsy. You see that 95% of the patients uh, uh, had the, uh, the diagnosis versus 85%. It doesn't look too much, but uh, uh, enough uh, uh, that, uh, to, to say that endobronchial cryobiopsy was, uh, had a superior diagnostic yield in comparison with conventional forceps biopsy. But there is also another side of that medal. Uh, in 13 patients, uh, APC was required uh, to, do the, to, uh, to, uh, to um, treat the bleeding after the biopsy. And the number of samples taken uh, was uh, that after the third sample, uh, the uh, probability of positive finding didn't grow, but the incidence of complication did. So what are the concerns? First, flexible forceps biopsies are limited of the, by, by the size of the forceps clause. M maximum size is around two or three millimeter with flexible forceps. And if we, if we use uh, forcepses for gastroenterology, for example, that have bigger claws, you can uh, f like three or four millimeters at the maximum. Uh, cryobiopsies uh, can be e extracted even when the cryoprobe is positioned tangentially, as I already mentioned, with a zero uh, degree angle towards the tissue, where the forceps biopsy has to be placed almost perpendicular. Okay, now. Uh, the, uh, these studies were a little biased. Why? Because all these studies were done German way. A rigid bronchoscopy intubation and do everything through the rigid scope. But when the patient has, is in general anesthesia and has myorelaxation, it's easier to place the rigid forceps over the tumor to take a biopsy and uh, uh, the effect, the benefit of cryobiopsy in these cases slightly diminishes. 
And another one, uh, another question which will I address later, what about uh, benign diseases? How good cryobiopsy is in benign diseases? First, one thing. How many samples would be optimal for good endobronchial cryobiopsy? This study on 50 patients by Turkish authors published recently showed that two biopsies are enough, three biopsies are too much, because incidence of bleeding raises after the third biopsy, and the positivity of finding practically stays the same. And safety is always a concern. Uh, bleeding, as I said, is a consequence of biopsy, not a complication. But variation of severe bleeding incidence in those studies varied from 0.3% to 18.2%. So such a huge variation. Why? Because different number of samples were taken during biopsies. Maybe because of the longer freezing time, maybe because of the mucosal tear. Mucosal tear is dangerous because normal mucosa tends sometimes to bleed more than tumor. And if you do, if you miss the tumor with a cryoprobe and do the normal mucosa biopsy, it causes more bleeding. Of course, bronchospasm is always a concern and after all, cryobiopsy is alternative. You do first normal uh, uh, biopsy with forceps, and if it fails, cryobiopsy. Why? Cryobiopsy requires general anesthesia, mandatory intubation, and it complicates the procedure. From outpatient, you have to hospitalize the patient and the costs raises and everything else. But things are changing recently. Why? Uh, because new instruments are developed. Now we have a cryoprobe, which is 1.1 millimeter in diameter. You can retrieve it through the working channel of the flexible bronchoscope like uh, a forceps, and it is as good as bigger probes. So maybe we are slightly moving cryobiopsy from to outpatient procedure in sedation or something. Maybe, but this tool needs more verification. Second thing is therapy. Okay, cryotherapy is not very popular when we have rapid, fast uh, disobstruction techniques, but it has some uh, advantages, like a delayed effect. If we want to treat something which is inside the trachea, it's not uh, obstructing it completely. Uh, either it's benign or malignant disease, you can do it with cryotherapy. And cryorecanalization is another way of using cryoprobe as an immediate disobstructive technique. But it can lead to some dangers. First, uh, how it's performed. You fastly, you de debulk the tumor by freezing it to the center of the tumor to three to seven seconds, depends on the diameter of the probe you use, and in immediately you remove the tumor. In this study, success rate was over 90%, bleeding was around 12%, and uh, other techniques were used to stop the bleeding argon plasma coagulation. But I will be very cautious to do that in uh, tumors which have bases broader than two centimeters. Why? Because you risk airway perforation. You risk the air airway wall perforation. Of course, if the tumor is in, on the cartilaginous wall, then the danger is much less pronounced. When we are using uh, cryotherapy, uh, we sometimes forgot one thing, which I always promote, that uh, cryotherapy is effective also in benign diseases, as benign tracheal disease. And when you have fresh granulation tissue, actually um, the, the, the cryogen is inhibiting the growth of fibroblasts by inducing their apopt apoptosis. So we can use cryotherapy in benign disorders. I prefer to keep it simple where I'm doing, when I'm doing cryotherapy, you see I'm using these guides instead of flexible bronchoscope through the rigid bronchoscope. It's very good because uh, it can bend during the, the, the procedure as good as flexible bronchoscope and I don't like too many cables around me when I'm doing anything. And in this patient, which is very interesting because it was the relapse of sarcoidosis inside the airway, Cryoprobe was applied to the anterior wall of the trachea, 
so there was no risk of perforation and just doing normal proper cryotherapy. One patch after another and then result was like that six months after therapy but with inhaled corticosteroid treatment. After removal of foreign bodies sometimes granulations occur. You can treat them safely and effectively by cryotherapy. You see it was after immediately the third picture is after immediately after foreign body removal and after cryotherapy the picture looks like that much better. It can cause uh, if the if these fresh granulations were going into the fibrotic stenosis, then it will be no help for the patient. This is treatment of endobronchial tuberculosis, tumorous form of endobronchial tuberculosis combined with antituberculotic drugs and cryotherapy. As you can see, effect was good. Endobronchial tuber tumorous form of endobronchial tuberculosis is very prone to relapsing and you can treated good with cryotherapy. But how about malignancy? Well, in malignancies, we usually combine all these treatments. Cryo for recanalization, more for extraction than for recanalization. Like in this patient we had recently, the patient had left pneumonectomy because of the lung cancer. Tumor uh, was arising from right lateral tracheal wall and less of the 30% of tracheal lumen was free and uh, the length of the, 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 the tracheal involvement was around uh, 34, uh, 34 millimeters. Now you all know this four box approach. And we actually decided to do the debulking, but following by uh, either removing the tissue with forceps or remove it with the cryoprobe. The, well, first debulking with the shaft of the rigid bronchoscope. Really, just it was just enough to, to, to get the tumor inside the, uh, uh, inside the scope and when you are pressing, you are stopping the bleeding at the same time. Okay? And then, why did we choose uh, the rigid cryoprobe? Because patient has only one lung. If that tumor dropped into the only lung that patient has, it can cause problems of obstruction of the single uh, main bronchus that patient has. So we decided to remove the tissue with the cry cryoprobe unblock. It is necrotic tissue. If I try it with forceps, I have to do it maybe three, four times, and uh, it is time lost for the ventilation of patient. And of course, the bleeding occurred, yes, and we have to deal with that. We had to deal with bleeding also, with argon plasma coagulation. And after we did after we treated the base of the tumor, we decided to, uh, okay, now what? Rebiopsy was performed, we are waiting for the results. Uh, maybe tumor changed, maybe we can do something on uh, using TKIs or something because it was adenocarcinoma. But actually, the, uh, way, ma the way to make this airway patent, to stay patent, we used intraluminal brachytherapy combined with transcutaneous radiotherapy. And actually, the effect, as you can see, was really good after all these procedures. What are the limitations and precautions on cryorecanalization? First, uh, it's safer when you are doing it on a surface which is cryoresistant. Second, uh, thrombosis is one of the effects of the cryogen on the tumor, but thrombosis occurs only in the frozen tissue, not all parts of the tumor, which can result in delayed bleeding, and something that is uh, very often occurs when we are doing cr either cryobiopsy or cryorecanalization. Basis of the lesion should not be broad, because there is a risk of wall perforation if you try to pull everything unblock. There is a time gap while you are removing the probe with frozen tissue too, and tumor can bleed in the meantime. And 
always you need plan B, contingency plan. APC, rigid, cold saline, tranexamic acid, gauze on the forceps or on the needle with adrenaline or nafazoline. Uh, you have to be ready to stop the bleeding after all these procedures. And to conclude, endoscopic cryotherapy has multiple indications, relatively short learning curve, highly efficient, good safety profile, can be used both in malignant and non-malignant uh, central airway obstruction, but I really believe that all central airway obstruction are malignant because of their localization, not of, because of their nature. Cryorecalinization is also a good alternative method to other mechanical or hot techniques for debulking of endoluminal lesions, but we always, always need to have plan B for bleeding, which is the most serious complications. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'd like to inform you that uh, in April next year, there is a World Congress of Bronchology and Interventional Pulmonology in Shanghai to send your abstracts. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Professor Popovic, for your illustrative talk as usual. And uh, now uh, I invite Professor Alice Roseman. His talk will be cryotherapy for parenchymal lung lesions. So thank you very much and nice greetings to all of you, of you who are here in the hall. I talk about uh, cryobiopsy for parenchymal lesions. Uh, if we would go directly to rounded lesion or small lesion or tumor, this talk would be very short because we have only two studies on that topic. But I think that much more interesting is if we broaden the topic and uh, also say a word or two about uh, diffuse parenchymal lung diseases. Okay, the time is running. So, let's go. So, um, I will make a short uh, introduction about the parenchymal lesion or diffuse parenchymal infiltrates. Uh, as as Passe already told in his lecture before, we have many cryoprobes available now from 1.1 millimeter, which is just new on the market, to 2.4 millimeters if you want to get some bigger samples. Uh, but let's go first to the data about peripheral lesions. As I'm aware, there's only one, actually there are two studies, the other one is smaller and more observational, about diagnosing the peripheral lesions smaller than four centimeters at the lung periphery. This one was published four years ago in the, five years ago in the European Respiratory Journal. Four, 39 patients were included with the lesions smaller than four millimeters in uh, larger diameter and cryobiopsy and forceps biopsy uh, were performed in the randomized fashion. So here we see the data in the 31 patients biopsy was taken. Diagnostic yield by cryoprobe was a little bit higher than with the uh, forceps, time required was much longer and procedure was very much complicated. There were no actually uh, no big complication about that, but it seems that the method of acquiring tissue from the peripheral lesion is so uncomfortable that after that we are all a little bit reluctant uh, that we uh, to, to catch smaller lesions in the moderate sedation and local anesthesia and so on patients where the complete bronchoscope should be removed together with the cryoprobe and so on and so on as Passway Popovich already uh, described. Maybe the more interesting part of this story are diffuse parenchymal lung diseases, sometimes called also confusing parenchymal lung diseases because we have here a huge overlap in the field of interstitial pneumonias, lung fibrosis, connective tissue diseases, and so on and so on. And this topic is very interesting in the last years when new drugs, antifibrotic, came on the market. And it's very uh, desirable that we have an accurate diagnosis before we give this expensive drug to the patients. And uh, the next thing, diffuse lung diseases are not lung cancer. So in this case, histological diagnosis is not automatically the final diagnosis. In diffuse lung diseases, we have certain pathological patterns, and the final diagnosis uh, is made on the multidisciplinary group when you go for the radiological data and clinical data and so on, and we connect the pathological pattern with the uh, clinical data. In opposite, as in lung cancer, where tissue is the issue, and from the tissue we get everything what we want, including molecular markers. Ten years ago, there were reports about getting a bigger and better sample of the tissue with the cryoprobe. As you see, these samples are much better than with forceps biopsies. And at that time, maybe it was not so much interest because these antifibrotic drugs were not on the market. But later, 
many centers started to perform cryo biopsies of the lung parenchyma as well, and the results were more or less the same. They have a nice pieces of tissue of diameter approximately five millimeters, and the pathologists connected them on the same slide. The diagnostic yield increased very much in comparison with the forceps biopsy. But what happened in the real life? So each center invented cryo biopsy on his own. So there is a large variation, huge variation in, in practice. Some use the blocker balloon, some rigid, some use rigid bronchoscope, some use flexible bronchoscope, some centers perform this in general sedation. There were only centers, there are also some centers who perform only local anesthesia. Uh, diameter of cryopro, freezing time, and so on. <clears throat> what happened here was the technique which spread very quickly without proper uh, training or evaluation what's good and what's good, what is not good, give a large variability in pathological diagnostic seals, bleeding risks, and pneumothorax, which are the major complication of parenchymal cryobiopsy. So here you can see that uh, um, although the cryobiopsy seems better, at the very beginning it seems better than forceps biopsy, the range of pneumothorax in different centers from 0 to 26 percent, serious bleeding from 0 to 42 percent, and it was much more than in forceps biopsy. So our target area to get the tissue is approximately 1 or 1.5 centimeters away from the visceral pleura. If we go too close, we risk a pneumothorax. If we stay deep, we don't get the proper sample and we risk to tear a bigger vessel and get a more severe bleeding. So, as the safety precaution, the use of fluoroscopy is highly warranted. Here you see the cryoprobe of some centimeter from the visceral pleura, and as you see, you just tear a part of the lung. And the next precaution, the blocker balloon is very helpful. Here you can see how finely it seals the peripheral bleeding, but when we open it, there is a lot of blood, and we are able to control that. We just uh, blow the balloon once again, and we uh, aspirate the blood, and everything is under control. In comparison, we not use the blocker balloon. So what is the best practice? The best practice was summarized a year ago in the respiration of this publication. I really recommend you to read this one, but it's too long. I won't present everything from this publication. So the, one of the main issues is also the role of multidisciplinary team. So the cryobiopsy is not the tool for us interventional cowboys who just want to do something new and get a big pieces of tissue, but there should be a clear indication made on multidisciplinary group where also sits the doctor who don't have any profit from the interventional pulmonology uh, by themselves. So that they, they are people with, with uh, uh, not too hot hat. So in this uh, um, publication was written what's the role of cryobiopsy, uh, diagnostic, uh, how we select the patients, uh, what should pathologists know and do about that, contraindications and safety precautions, where and how this cryobiopsy should be performed, and who should perform this cryobiopsy. So, if we quote uh, Dr. House, MD, better murder than diagnosis, this is not true in any case. So, better safe and fine patients than, than complications. We also have a nice publication here where the observation of previous results and complication and changing of the practice give the, gave the improvement in the patient's safety. For example, uh, in the center which published this study, they noticed that they have a lot of pneumothoraxes, that they have a lot of moderate and a lot of severe bleeding. And then they decided that they would use a blocker balloon they would shorten freezing time a little bit and reduce the number of samples from five on three, from five samples to three samples, because they observed that the diagnostic yield after the sample is not increasing anymore. And what happened? They have less than half uh, of pneumothoraxes as before, and they practically didn't have moderate and severe bleeding because they were able to control the, with the blocker balloon nearer to the source at, at the level of the segmental bronchus. So, very nice uh, uh, example how the review of, of your results and improving of the practice can be better for the patients. What is the position of cryobiopsy? Here already uh, meta-analysis, <coughs> uh, mainly comparison with the force of biopsy. Of course, cryobiopsy is better than the force of biopsy, that's clear. And also uh, in the terms, uh, he, we have two categories here, histological diagnosis, 
and the multidisciplinary team diagnosis. The most important is multidisciplinary team diagnosis at the end, because histology, as we said, is only histological pattern. And here you can see that at the end, when carabapsis are uh, made uh, okay and in, in uh, uh, agreement with the standards, the uh, multidisciplinary group is able to make a quite a solid diagnosis in more than 80% of the cases. Is the place of prior biopsy before surgical biopsy? Uh, this study uh, uh, showed that the majority of the patients who go to cryo biopsy can avoid surgical biopsy because they get a very solid diagnosis. So this is, uh, in short, safe and feasible diagnostic yield. This means uh, histological diagnostic yield is good, 76%. Agreement is uh, good between pathologists. <coughs> if multiple pathologists are uh, evaluating the sample, uh, in the group was a lot of UIP patients, which is considered the most difficult diagnosis. And what is also interesting in this study is that a lot of samples contained, um, <coughs> biopsies were taken very close to visceral pleura, and a lot of samples have uh, pieces of the visceral pleura or interlobular septa. And here mirrors in the percentage of pneumothoraxes, which was very high in this study. <coughs> Just for the taste, I show two real-life studies, one from German group from Heidelberg, more than 100 of patients. Diagnostic yield after multidisciplinary group consensus more than 80 percent, rate of uh, complications very low, and a huge study from Italy where more than almost 700 patients were included. Again, diagnostic yield on multidisciplinary group was high, and the rate of complications also acceptable, with a little bit higher percentage of the pneumothoraxes. Uh, the reason I already mentioned before. So I briefly show you also the data from our clinics uh, on maybe two slides. We perform a little bit more than 100 uh, patients. 49 were uh, ana analyzed here in, uh, with these preliminary results. Uh, average age for 66 years. The uh, major uh, deficit in lung function was diffusion capacity. Um, Biopsy samples were around 5 millimeters. The majority of the patient had UIP, chronic hypersensitivity of pneumonitis, and no specific interstitial pneumonia, as you see here. Complication rate 10% of the patient had pneumothorax, six of them required a chest tube. There were six severe bleeding, but all were um, under control by this blocker balloon, which we uh, use. But we um, defined the severe bleeding with the bleeding time, because in one patient, even after 20 minutes of blocker balloon usage, there was still blood coming out of the segmental bronchus. And that's why four procedures were uh, terminated prematurely. We didn't take five samples, as in all other patients. And one patient had atrial fibrillation. So the position of cryobiopsy should be before the surgical biopsy with multidisciplinary group, more than 80%. But where is the real evidence for that? Do we have any comparison between surgical biopsy and the cryobiopsy? Do we have any data about that? Is, this is what I showed till now. It's just a speculation. The patients who had the cryopsy didn't have a surgical biopsy. Are these results okay? So we get some data this year, there were two studies published, and the first one was practically a death blow for cryobiopsy of the diffuse, in the diffuse lung diseases. Uh, it was performed in, uh, multi, um, in two centers, Italian and French centers. 21 patients were included. Uh, after the multidisciplinary group sent the patients to cryobiopsy in one session, in one uh, anesthesia, cryobiopsy and surgical lung biopsy were performed. Then the local pathologist examined the, the, the specimens. Another session with the same multidisciplinary group make a diagnosis, and then the pathological samples were sent to another pathologist who was blind for all the, how these samples were acquired and also for diagnosis, and results were actually uh, a, lo a lot of disagreement between all these three groups. So from 21 patients, only in six patients was agreement on the same diagnosis. Additionally, seven patients were in agreement with multidisciplinary group and surgical biopsy, only three with multidisciplinary group and uh, cryobiopsy, surgical and, and uh, cryobiopsy, there was a lot of disagreement. And uh, what was the worst, and also uh, multidisciplinary group in five cases didn't agree neither with cryobiopsy, neither with surgical biopsy. So percentages of agreement are listed here, which is very low. And what was especially uh, 
unfavorable for cryobiopsy was that if surgical biopsy was not performed, approximately 50% of the patients would uh, have a different diagnosis and in most cases, most probably also a different treatment. And here is a quite a difference if chronic, if, if, it, if it treat a patient, for example, with corticosteroids against, uh, in comparison with antifibrotic and so on and so on. Luckily, another study was published several months later, a bigger one, a better, with a better protocol from Australia, when 65 patients were um, also performed sequential biopsy in the same anesthesia, uh, with cryobiopsy and surgical biopsy. Samples were then paired and masked, and uh, multidisciplinary group knew only the number of the samples. And what was also a good thing, that the clinical data and the radiological data were also, that the names of the patients were also hidden, they were just numbers. And then there was a uh, final diagnosis in the multidisciplinary group, and results are more, more, much more favorable in, uh, in the favor of cryobiopsy. Here we have data for transbronchial cryobiopsy, histopathological patterns, and multidisciplinary group diagnosis. Here is surgical lung biopsy, and as you see that these percentages and numbers are more or less very similar in both groups. What are the good news here is if we get the diagnosis uh, with high confidence with cryobiopsy, there is usually also practically almost complete agreement with surgical lung biopsy and multidisciplinary group, as we see here. If there is a high confidence, it's high confidence in all groups. There are only two cases where a surgical lung biopsy gave a different diagnosis and in one case where the surgical sample was worse than cryobiopsy. If there is a diagnosis of low confidence, also in the majority of the cases, also a surgical biopsy is at the same grade zone and multidisciplinary group the same. But in eight cases, the surgical biopsy gave a different results. In four cases, better. In four cases, worse. And if there is an unclassifiable result after the cryobiopsy, this more or less uh, surgical biopsy saves some cases at the very end. So here, again, the percentages of the agreement among different methods. Overall, the multidisciplinary group agreement and histopathological agreement is more or less the same as we saw from the uh, other uh, meta-analysis data. If there is a high confidence in cryobiopsy result, there is usually also a high concordance with surgical lung biopsy. But if there is a low uh, confidence in cryobiopsy or unclassifiable disease, in some cases, in these cases, maybe it's better to send the patient also to surgical biopsy, where some patients can get a more stable diagnosis. So the conclusion is that there is a minimal risk that the patient get the wrong diagnosis if we get the diagnosis from, surgic, from a cryobiopsy with a high confidence. So I won't lose the words for the conclusions. I would just say parenchymal cryobiopsy is here. And uh, if we see, at least from our experiences, and also there are uh, experiences for other centers, that uh, since we have it, the uh, patients have more, much more accurate diagnosis as before when patients who didn't have accurate diagnosis of fibrotic lung diseases and they should be sent to surgical biopsy. A lot of them was not sent to surgical biopsy because of the fear that they, uh, want, uh, they will have complication about it. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, uh, Professor uh, Rossman, for the cryotherapy, uh, your elastive token uh, cryotherapy for parenchymal lesion. And now we're inviting uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Ahmed Youssef uh, for uh, his session, cryotherapy spray in uh, plural lesions. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. First, I would uh, like to thank uh, Professor Tariq Safwa to Professor Ashraf uh, Hatem on the support of the presentation. The second thing I would like to thank my friends on the chairperson. And we will talk about pleural cryotherapy. Brief uh, history. Uh, as we all know, uh, cryotherapy derived from uh, the branch of cryobiology, which study uh, cell preservation, which facilitate transplantation and the blood product preservation. 
and uh, cell destruction that is called cryotherapy. Uh, we have a total cryotherapy, this is called hydrotherapy, like this one, for the total body, and localized area, and this is called also cryotherapy. So, cryotherapy means controlled application of extreme cold for the destruction of abnormal tissues. Ancient Egyptian, the first to prescribe uh, cryotherapy, and Hippocrates found that the local cold exposure had the ability to reduce swelling, bleeding, and pain. Uh, James Arnold, uh, the first, uh, uh, yani the father of the modern uh, cryosurgery, uh, the first prescriber of uh, using cryotherapy for treatment of uh, breast carcinoma. Uh, at the end of the uh, 19th century, uh, the race for liquid gas began. Uh, this is the principle, uh, as uh, Dr. Special uh, told me, this is a uh, cryogen. We can use for cryotherapy either liquid nitrogen at minus 196, carbon dioxide at 80, minus 80, nitrous oxide at minus 90, ferion and uh, argon. Uh, biological effect of uh, freezing depends on the uh, uh, minus uh, degree region. Uh, if at uh, minus 2 or minus 10, nothing will occur and 90-90% of the cell will viable. Uh, at minus uh, 40 and uh, more, uh, there is a crystal uh, destruction uh, of the cell uh, uh, organelle, uh, causing 90% destruction of the cell. Uh, this is immediately during freezing. After uh, two, after two days, uh, there is a vascular effect of cryotherapy uh, due to vascular occlusion and the infarction leading to more and more cell necrosis. And after seven to ten days, there is the immunological effect of uh, cryo uh, as necrotic cell act as an immunostimulator. This is the cryoresistant tissues, nerve sheaths, cartilage, fibrous tissue, fat, and the bone, and the cryosensitive skin, mucous membrane, vascular endothelium, nerve cell, and the granulation tissue. Cryotherapy is a cheap uh, in comparison to laser therapy, easy to perform, safe, and the biopsy extracted from the tumor can be uh, performed. But uh, for the pleura uh, cryotherapy, there is this advantage or better called limitation. Uh, due to the delayed effect of cryo, uh, there may, may be one or more session uh, required for treating uh, the mesothelioma or treating metastatic diseases, and this is depend on the size. If there is uh, a small uh, tumor early, we can one session is enough. If it is longer, uh, larger, uh, two or three sessions uh, required. Uh, we can uh, overcome this uh, by using the treatment of cryospray for more than 25 minutes instead of endobronchial, which is lasting for 10 minutes only. The second limitation uh, for the follow-up of the tumor. If we have an endobronchial uh, tumor, we can uh, do even everyday bronchoscopy. But uh, for uh, pleural tumors, uh, it is nonsense to do every, every day thoracoscopy. Uh, so for the follow-up of the tumor, treating after one session uh, of cryo, uh, it is uh, 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 in, uh, impractical to do follow-up by thoracoscopy. Uh, but uh, to uh, use this one uh, for follow-up of the tumor, we can follow by ultrasonography, CT, and beta scan. So you can overcome the first limitation by uh, prolonged use of uh, cryotherapy for more and more time, and the second limitation by using follow-up by ultrasound, CT, and bit scan. Also the same for uh, intrapleural cryotherapy, uh, like endobronchial cryotherapy, we can use a technique for cryotherapy, cryobiopsy, cryoablation, and more recently cryospray. We can use uh, for the uh, pleural uh, diseases cryotherapy as a diagnostic modality, like we can take uh, through the thoracoscopy the peripheral lung tumor or visceral tumor uh, lung biopsy, and also we can uh, take a pleural biopsy. And for uh, cryotherapy of the pleura, uh, it can be therapeutic for treatment of mesothelioma and metastatic pleural diseases.
Uh, this is the device, and this is the probe, and this is the rigid thoracoscopy. Uh, this is the probe, and this is uh, how can uh, the probe of the cryo uh, working in the endobronchial lesion? Because it is small, so this probe can cope with the treatment of this small tumor. But for the pleura, we have an extended disease, extended tumor. And I think this probe is not working. You need more than two or three days to work like on this tumor. This is a small tumor on the visceral pleura, so we can use this probe of Erby. But for this extended tumor, we should have a way uh, for treating this tumor by what is called the cryo spray. This is a rigid, and we can also use a semi-rigid uh, thoracoscopy for biopsy. Uh, this is a probe for cryo, and we can use a biopsy directly from the parietal pleura. Sometimes uh, there is a difficulty to have a, a tumor uh, or to have a, a, a biopsy by the cryo probe from directly from the parietal pleura. So we start to do, uh, inject by transbronchial needle or aspiration needle uh, 5 cc of uh, saline uh, underneath the pleura. So there is raising of the pleura and separation of the pleura from the uh, chest wall so that the biopsy by cryobiopsy will be uh, easy and take a more and more sizable biopsy. Uh, this is a probe through, uh, we can use uh, rigid, flexible, and sometimes if uh, in the neural center there is no rigid or semi-rigid uh, thoracoscopy, we can use the flexible bronchoscopy itself through the, uh, through the uh, thoracoscopy, tumor, uh, thoracoscopy tube, and we can use a cryobiopsy uh, with a very sizable uh, biopsy. This is the difference between the multiple forceps biopsy and the uh, uh, cryobiopsy through the thoracoscope or fiber optic bronchoscopy used as a thoracoscopy. Uh, another uh, technique for, uh, uh, for treating a uh, tumor of the pleura by uh, cryotherapy, uh, what is called endocare console or cryoablation. Uh, here we use uh, uh, transcutaneous uh, needles uh, from one up to nine uh, needles through a chest wall, directly to the uh, pleural tumor or peripheral tumors. Uh, here, we, uh, according to the size of the tumor, we can use up to three needles. Again, uh, this is the endobronchial tumor, uh, and we can use this probe. But for this one, it is too much to use a small probe for treating uh, pleural tumors. So, uh, the, uh, the introduction of uh, cryospray first in America by, uh, in Mayo Clinic. And for uh, spray cryotherapy, uh, first uh, used in uh, 2000 uh, for treating esophageal malignancy. And in uh, 2015, started the trachea and the pleural uh, malignancy treatment by cryospray. Uh, in Alexandria, we have uh, two uh, papers for diagnosis of uh, pleural disease. Uh, the first one was a comparison between uh, cryobiopsy in the pleura and uh, hot biopsy forceps of the electrocautery. Uh, this was uh, under cold and hot. Both can, could be applied to the lung uh, in International Society of Cryotherapy Congress in Madrid 2013. Uh, it is uh, comparable and uh, the same result between cryobiopsy and hot biopsy forceps. Uh, there was a one uh, a complications for the uh, cryobiopsy uh, was one uh, case uh, have a, a bronchopleural fistula. Uh, another uh, thoracoscopic pleural biopsy in uh, 2015, 19. Uh, 20 cases, comparative study between cryobiopsy and the forceps, rigid and the flexible uh, forceps. Uh, for cryospray, uh, we introduced uh, the cryospray in 2019 as a therapeutic modality. Up to now, we treat six cases of pleural tumors, three cases mesothelioma, two cases adenocarcinoma metastatic, and one case malignant melanoma. Uh, 
and uh, 25 cases of bronchial tumor and stricture. Uh, this is a device, and it is very expensive, about uh, 100 to 150,000 uh, dollars. So uh, we use in uh, Alexandria uh, the device like this one for dermatology, and we have some probe connected to this uh, device and use it as a cryo spray using liquid nitrogen. So if you want to uh, have a less uh, price or less costly uh, cryo spray, we can have this uh, machine of dermatology and this tank for storage of liquid nitrogen, like this one. This is a tank for liquid nitrogen. This is the device for dermatology. And this is a probe, rigid probe for rigid uh, bronchoscopy and also for rigid thoracoscopy. And another one for flexible uh, bronchoscopy and the flexible uh, semi-rigid thoracoscopy. Uh, this is through the rigid thoracoscopy, and this is to read how to treat a very big uh, tumor with malignant melanoma. Uh, this is a malignant melanoma, and this is after cryo spray, and this is after melt at once of the malignant melanoma. This is before and after cryo. Uh, some video. Uh, this is how the flexible uh, uh, probe work for fiber optic bronchoscopy and semi-rigid thoracoscopy. This is how the rigid cryospray work for rigid bronchoscopy and rigid thoracoscopy. And this is a case of uh, mesothelioma treated by cryotherapy, cryospray. This is the vapor of the liquid. This is a huge mass between the middle loop and uh, right lower loop. This is a rigid probe for cry spray. We have to, uh, two minutes to five minutes uh, uh, spraying liquid nitrogen and then wait for uh, evaporization of the gas. And then another one, another one, another one. About 20 to 25 minutes. This is, a, this is a lung, this is a chest wall, and this is a huge mesothelium. We start again by cryo spray. And thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, Professor Ahmed Yusuf, for this illustrative talk. Professor Ahmed Yusuf is one of the experts in the field of cryo. Uh, now I want to announce that the lecture of Abbott Symposium will be in Hall A, starting from uh, 5.30. And tomorrow we will start the lectures from 10.00. Uh, AM, so please uh, be tomorrow in, in 10 AM, and now you, we can move to the uh, other hall. Many thanks for all for you for being with us until this time, and many thanks, Professor Ahmed Yusuf, for your talk again.